frankly, in South Florida, we don't really see sinkholes. Now, I'm not making a disclaimer <laughs> here that, that you'll never see a sinkhole in South Florida. Personally, I've only seen red tide in Florida a couple of times, and there's different kinds of red tide. We all know about the beautiful beaches, the gorgeous water, the sand. We know about the weather. Well, in today's video, I'm gonna be getting into all the particulars about some of these things that are gonna be really important to you if you're considering moving to Florida. So let's get right into it. So the number one that I hear is home inspection. Well, in Florida, for the majority, 99% of the contracts are the as-is contract. Buyer may conduct inspections as buyer sees fit. And also, buyer may cancel this contract by written notice and thereupon buyer and seller be released of all further obligations under this contract. The first thing is you're looking for hidden problems meaning that home inspector is gonna be going up into the attic and see what the strapping is in the roof, if there's any wiring that's hanging out. Maybe there's some pests up there that you don't know about. The next, financial surprises, unexpected costs. So you wanna know what's going on with this house. There might be some things that need to be repaired and you can negotiate those out if you were to say not go to contract or not close with them. They still have to disclose those things for instance, but you wanna be thinking about those safety risks, right? Negotiation, again, you can use this as a negotiating tool to potentially reduce the price, maybe get closing costs back. Insurance, now that four point and the wind mitigation report, that is going to be done into what those preventative things that you might wanna to do to repair on the house, or hey, maybe you know we need to budget for that new roof. Now, and lastly, I don't want to leave out, there's something to do with a home inspection that has to do with China. I'm going to be getting into that a little bit later, so stick around for that. So number two is mold. I highly suggest getting a mold test, especially on older homes. Maybe on a newer home, it's a big deal because that can really be a respiratory problem for your family. I don't want to set off major, major alarms here or anything with you know mold being a big issue in Florida. However, there's an old saying, it's never a problem until it's a problem. Number three is insurance. Now this is a massive buzzword that's going around because in the last couple of years, we've had some hurricanes come through that have kind of wiped out some things and the insurance companies have actually left Florida. So your insurance company is gonna look at that. Do they have double strapping in the roof? Do they have shutters? Do they have a reinforced garage? What shape is the roof in? So then that report is gonna be able to give them an idea of what the risk is that they're gonna be putting as a premium on your home. So if you don't have all of that protection, then the property is more risky for them and your premium is gonna go up. So a couple of other pieces to insurance are gonna be flood insurance. Remember we're in Florida, so a lot of this is at sea level, right? So a lot of these homes are only six to 12 feet above sea level, which as far as the elevation is concerned, this is backed up by FEMA. FEMA actually subsidizes flood insurance. Also, sinkholes. This is an add-on. So if you wanted to have sinkhole insurance, this is something that you can add on. You can talk to your insurance company about this. Frankly, in South Florida, we don't really see sinkholes. Now, I'm not making a disclaimer <laughs> here that, that you'll never see a sinkhole in South Florida but most of the sinkholes are in Northern Florida. Remember, Florida is a really big state. There's different kinds of terrain and soil, and I'm not a geologist, so I'm not gonna get into that either. So number four we're gonna be talking about is sinkholes. I'm actually gonna read off here something that I compiled about sinkholes because I'm not an expert in sinkholes, so I wanna give you a really articulate understanding of what to be thinking about with sinkholes. So let's get into that. So sinkholes have been a geological phenomenon in Florida for thousands of years, and in our recent development, they arise due to the state's unique geological characteristics. Now, Florida's bedrock is primarily composed of limestone. Sinkholes in Florida have been observed and documented for centuries. While sinkholes have always existed in Florida, the state's rapid population growth and urbanization have increased the likelihood of human encounters with sinkholes, leading to greater awareness of the issue. 
Now, why sinkholes are bad? I think I articulated a little bit there. We're going, oh my God, dissolution of water and sulfur and all this stuff. Personally, lived here in Florida for over 25 years. I've never met anybody that's seen a sinkhole. I want you to be aware that this is something in Florida, not so much in South Florida, but I wanted you to be aware of it. So number five is red tide. Personally, I've only seen red tide in Florida a couple of times and there's different kinds of red tides. And like the last one on sinkhole, I wanna kind of read specifically some things that I researched for you that had to do with red tide. So let's dive right in. So the causes and characteristics of red tide. The first is an algae bloom. This results from excessive growth of toxic algae like Carina brevis and releasing brevitoxins. The media makes, blows this stuff up by the way. All right, so I've had people call me and say, oh my God, there's an algae bloom down there. You gotta get out of there. And I'm like, I'm looking at the algae bloom right now and it's not that bad. However, so that's not red tide, that's an algae bloom. They aren't always toxic. That's some of the things that we wanna get into. Now the economic impact, of, obviously people come down here to go to the beaches and if there's red tide and they can't go to the beaches, that affects tourism and then that has a chain of effect on the economy as well. If you wanna make sure that you have the least amount of potential for red tide, I would consider the East Coast. So number six is flooding. How? We get a lot of rain in Florida, especially if there's a hurricane that comes or a tropical depression or so forth. In the summertime, we get a lot more rain than the wintertime. I'm gonna go over the four different kinds of flooding that I want you to consider when moving to Florida. Now, coastal flooding. Now, Southeast Florida is a highly susceptible to coastal flooding, especially during hurricanes and tropical storms. So rising sea levels and storm surge can inundate coastal areas, causing significant property damage and posing safety risks. Many areas in Southeast Florida have an intricate network of canals and rivers. Now, heavy rains and stormwater runoff can cause the water of these bodies to overflow, leading to flooding in nearby neighborhoods. I want to get into some maybe a little bit of a story here. A lot of times when I'm, you know, people hear about flooding and then they'll come to Florida and they'll say, oh, there's water there. Should I be concerned about flooding? And then I'll always go back to what did the elevation certificate say for what floodplain you're in? Just because you live near a body of water doesn't mean if there's a lot of rain that that body of water is gonna end up in your house. But if you are near a canal, that's definitely something to consider, but go back to that elevation certificate so that you understand how high above that median base flood elevation what your risk is given a lot of that flooding. Now, the last one is inland flooding. Now, while coastal areas are particularly vulnerable, inland regions can also experience flooding due to heavy rains or river overflow. Now, homes located in low-lying areas or near bodies of water that are at higher risk. It's how high above that base flood elevation you are. Number seven is homeowners association and condo association. With a homeowners association and a condo association, they are going to have done all of this different flood elevation. They're worked out all the insurance and all that stuff. They're gonna have the hurricane protection and they're gonna have their bonded policy for that homeowners association for insurance. So homeowners fees, assess potential high HOE fees that could strain your budget. Now this is something you wanna look at as far as you have your mortgage payment, right? Or if you buy the property outright cash, remember you're gonna have this as a cost and it can potentially go up. So if it's already high and it's stressing your potential budget, that might not be the building for you. You wanna understand that a homeowners association is going to have rules and regulations. So those rules and regulations are something you really wanna go over and be absolutely clear on what those rules and regulations are because we don't wanna be rule breakers, right? Assessments, prepare for unexpected special assessments and major expenses. I don't wanna scare you, but some of these buildings were not built with the understanding of how long they may be around. And also there's something that happens, it's called spalling. Now, spalling is when moisture comes in, it gets into the rebar and rusts it out. And when it rusts it out, it actually is attached to the concrete and it creates a gap. 
and then it starts to deteriorate management. Evaluate the quality of the HOA management company and the impact on your condo community. A conflict resolution. You're sharing the building with other people. So just understand that we all have to get along well in the sandbox, right? So if you want to live alone and you don't want to have somebody telling you that you got to do this or you got to do that, you're not complying with the rules and regs, then you might want to think about a house. Rental restrictions. You just want to understand what those rental restrictions are before you're like, hey, I'm going to buy this and rent it out. Well, make sure you understand the rental restrictions. Financial health. Again, review the HOA's financial health and the potential issue that goes into those reserve funds as well. Now, I'm super excited about number 10. It has to do with China, and it has something to do with when I first got into the business. I'd never heard of it. Actually, nobody had ever heard of it because it just came in when I got in in 2006. There's a little hint. Stick around. I'm going to tell you about the Chinese situation you might want to know about. Let's get into the next point, population explosion. Let's get down to the brass tacks of this. A thousand people a day moving to Florida, right? So we have more people moving in than are moving out. Well, how does this relate to you? It depends. It was more of like what I feel like I like. So it's going to depend on you. So a thousand people a day is not going to be busting us at the seams. That's also why you want to reach out to us and say, I had somebody reach out to me the other day and like, is Stuart still the same way it was 20 years ago when I went there? And I said, yes and no. Downtown Stewart is almost exactly the same. They've not really knocked many buildings down. It looks very, very similar to what it looked like when I came here 20 years ago. Number nine, crime. Crime. All right, so there's different kinds of crime. There's petty crime, there's violent crime, and then there's property crime. Now, I'm gonna get into some specific numbers here that have to do with just averages of the counties in relation to the United States itself. So let's get into it right now. So crime in Palm Beach County. So this is just the average. The violent crime rate in Palm Beach County is 25.5, which is higher than the U.S. average of 22.7. Now crime is ranked on a scale of one to 100. So one is low, 100 is high. In Palm Beach County stands at 44.6, which is also significant higher than the U.S. average of 35.4. Now, this indicates that residents and visitors to Palm Beach County should take extra safety property uh, precautions when traveling in these areas. This is These are numbers. Personally, there's a lot of different areas in Palm Beach County. So there's hot areas, hot zones, which a good real estate agent will let you know where those hot areas are where there's other areas in Palm Beach County where you could literally leave your front door open and keys in your car. So this is not all of, oh my God, Palm Beach County has the above average crime rate. It depends on the area. So we're gonna bounce up to St. Lucie County here from Palm Beach County. So violent crime in St. Lucie County is a 26.9. St. Lucie County got ranked as one of the top 10 counties to live in in the United States by AARP. So people that are retiring, they don't want a lot of crime. I can tell you St. Lucie County, there's some areas where the majority of the crime is kind of isolated. And I'm not gonna put my hat on and tell you exactly where those areas are. Just being above the national average doesn't make St. Lucie County a bad place to live. But it is a 26.9 and the natural average. Property crime is 42.9. We just want you to be aware that it's a little bit higher than the national average, but you got Iowa in there, you got Wisconsin in there, you have these areas where there's very, very low crime. Martin County actually is below the national average for violent crime. Now remember, violent crime is 22.4 out of 100. Martin County is 16.4. So if you wanted the most safe county out of the three that I've mentioned so far, certainly Martin County would be that with a 16.4. Now when it comes to property crime, Martin County is exactly the same as the national average, 35.4. Let's get into the last one, which is Indian River County. It's actually at 17.4 for that violent crime. And remember, the national average is 22.7. So out of the four counties, if crime is your biggest consideration, Indian River County would be the place that you wanna go. Now, I'm glad you stuck around for number 10 because number 10 is Chinese drywall. 
Maybe you've never heard of Chinese drywall. I know I certainly had never had when I moved up here. Nobody had heard of it until 2006. Right around 2006, 2007 is when Chinese drywall came in. Why did it come in? Here's the reason. Inside of drywall, the major component in drywall is gypsum. Now, I'm not going to get into the, you know, I mentioned earlier, I'm not a geologist, I can't tell you about gypsum. But what ended up happening was there was such a housing boom, the demand for drywall went up. They ended up getting it from outside of the United States. And when you get it from outside of the United States, they ended up doing is they ended up substituting gypsum with sulfur. It's a noxious chemical that actually caused a lot of respiratory problems. It caused problems with plumbing. It caused problems with the AC units because those AC units, they actually have copper in the piping, which actually transfers the heat inside of the elements of the AC. And it started failing the AC system. So it was doing different things because basically that additive that they put in, which was sulfur, but there was other things that they put in there as well. So there ended up being these addenda that it became such a big issue that there became these Chinese drywall addendas. If you found Chinese drywall in the house, then you could actually get out of the contract. I want you to be aware that if you're buying a house between right around like 2005 and 2007, that's where the Chinese drywall happened. So you can actually get a test for it. But here's one of the things that you can do when going into those homes. If you go in and you smell rotten eggs, probably got Chinese drywall. Some people get a little tears in their eyes. Some people like kind of feel it in their chest. Other people feel it on their skin. It really depends. So the house could have been remediated and could be completely fine now. It's something I want you to be aware of because ultimately it can be a health issue. So I hope you enjoyed the top 10 questions that I've received over the years. I took a lot of time to think back on all of those questions that I've had. Those are the top 10. Well, maybe you have another question. Love to hear from you. Drop a comment below or feel free to reach out. I'm a real person. I really like to have these conversations. This is my passion. The agents on the team, this is their passion as well to answer questions and help people find the right property given their wants and needs. If you wanted to know about condos in the local area, check out this video here or any of my other videos that might answer some of the questions that you have about moving to South Florida. Till the next time, we'll see you on the next one.